And welcome everybody to the Smash News Network least busted name in news, our daily space weather videos. Congratulations on realizing our channel exists. We've decided to broadcast from the nexus of the galaxy today. We've got some spectacular imagery of the closest star once again. And we're seeing a breakdown of sunspots here. We're about to go back to zero sunspots later today as we see multiple groups setting down here in the southwest. A little bit of activity up here in the northeast. A little bit of activity down here in the southeast. And two active regions set to rise over the eastern limb in the coming days. We've got lots of additional wavelengths for you here. And some spectacular close-ups. Here's 1,600 and 1,700 angstroms. And again, the only sunspot groups we have are these ones down here. Two groups, both beta class, they've both degraded over the past 24 hours. Here's 171 and 304 angstroms. Again, areas to keep an eye on, and when I say eye on the pun is tensional, are up here and down here. Keep an intentional eye on those areas. More close-ups of the southwestern setting sunspots toward the end of the video. First, we'll blast through a whole bunch of data. As we're interested in all kinds of things besides visual analysis. So the 10.7 centimeter radio flux dropped down to, I believe, 82 here. Here's the one-year chart to put it in context. The black line is the radio flux. The red line is the sunspot number. And there's been a little bit of uh, anomalies going on here with the NOAA forecast for the most recent coronal mass ejections. I think I figured out why. They're not modeling coronal mass ejections on the opposite side of the sun. So if you look here, these most recent coronal mass ejections, you see none on the opposite side of the sun. So this is the Earth right here. This is stereo A and this is stereo B. And you can see this most recent coronal mass ejection, it's as if they didn't look at stereo A, as they have no coronal mass ejection on the far side of the sun. As you can see there, they've got the whole thing headed toward Earth when there were two separate components. There was one component that headed out in this direction, and another component that headed out in this direction. And that's why they'll both miss the Earth. So I have no idea how they're coming up with these forecasts, but we've, let's just say we've been correct in the past with our trajectory calculations. No space weather storms in the current forecast. Next, a brief look at global seismicity. Shout out to all of our viewers who feel earthquakes. I've been in many earthquakes and never felt one. I've even seen toilet water shifting back and forth, but because I was walking across a corporate hallway through some institutional doors, I never felt the quake. It's pretty weird. Here's the year to date of earthquakes. Here's the past 90 days from VolcanoDiscovery.com. Let's check the USGS list. And we had a large quake come in here as we did show prep here, coming in uh, near Fiji here. Also a deep quake there yesterday at 11.45 Universal Time. Looks like no major quakes over the past 24, but that one is approaching a 6 magnitude from the way that dot on the USGS map looks. Vanuatu also saw a deep quake. And some quakes in Southern California. Shout out to Nabo J. Here's a 5.8 at Japan. That's one of the largest of the past 24, if not the biggest quake of the past 24. And indeed, this Tongan quake here was a 5.2 magnitude. It was at depth a depth of 113 kilometers. Some volcanic activity kicking back up here. Stromboli has been erupting. It's not the calzone, it's not the ravioli, it's a stromboli. A stromboli and eruption at Stromboli. Fagradals Fjall also erupting a new lava flow and some lava fountaining happening there into the Gelding Aldazir, Geld, Gelding, Gelding Adelir Valley, Gelding Adelir Valley, Fagradals Fjall continuing its eruption after about seven days of dormancy. Suinosejima, unknown volcanic ash cloud from there. Samisa Pochnoi in the Aleutian Islands, producing about a 10,000-foot plume of volcanic ash there from the Mount Cerberus crater, named for the three-headed giant dog that guards the gates to the underworld. Publicatapetl exploding 
flight level 180. It's producing a 18,000-foot plume of volcanic ash over central Mexico. Fuego exploding as well, 15,000-foot ash plume over Guatemala. Revenador exploding, 15,000-foot ash plume over Ecuador. Sabancaya exploding, 24,000-foot ash plume over Peru. Please don't attempt to pull vault to Caldera. Please do visit our links and support the channel. Thanks to everybody who has. The print quality is spectacular. Please do not pull vault to Caldera. We prefer for our viewers to do rational things like press like, subscribe, etc. Thanks to the Smash team, the new true source of funding for the content, please consider becoming a member of the Smash team at smashamash.com slash smash team. You'll get perks nobody else gets to see. We'll show you more about that at a later time. Goes magnetometers over the past three days have been looking pretty spiky, and the Earth has moved into a south pole-oriented current sheet. If I had to guess, I would say it happened sometime around here. And those arc jet start and ends, those are when the GOES-16 or 17 use their thrusters, creating plasma which could affect their magnetometer readings. Here's the top view of the plane field plot showing the current sheet and its polarity. This data is from 51 ground-based magnetometers, the National Sunspot Observatory. Also stereo A out here at Lagrange point 5 and stereo B at Lagrange point 4. If you look at the latest image, you can see Earth is now in this red zone here. It's a south pole oriented current sheet having left the North Pole current sheet yesterday as we forecasted. Here's a line of sight view with the solar magnetometer. You can see the B field, that blue line there, shifting up to the north as a south pole current sheet shines through to the Earthly location. Here's your line of sight coronal hole plot. We do see some south pole oriented coronal holes rotating in here, some green north pole oriented coronal holes rotating out. This also shows you the sun's B field, the blue lines there. Those potential field surface source lines are the sun's B field, the B field being the field that goes through the magnet. Keep in mind the data is an hour and 37 minutes old. There's the latest. And again, some coronal holes rotating in ahead of some active regions that are set to rise over the eastern limb in the next two days. Solar flare probability gone down according to this. I say it's still a solar flare warning, but by tomorrow midday, we'll probably turn off our solar flare warning. Solar flare warning remains in effect. Coronal mass ejection watch is gone. Anyway, there's the computerized analysis of flare probability and detected sunspot groups as 2868 and 2866 set on the southwestern limb. The GOES X-ray flux here showing some very, very light amounts of flaring here over the past three days, including just a small C-class intensification earlier this morning while we were sleeping in. Pardon our lateness on the video. Here's the proton flux over the past three days. No spikes there. No relativistic protons headed our way at the moment. In my opinion, they would have already been here. And let's do the real-time solar wind. We've got some serious error bars here. As the data doesn't believe itself that the solar wind speed was as low as 245 kilometers per second. And the solar wind density as low as 0.45 protons per cubic centimeter. That's really diffuse and really, really slow. And I would tend to agree, maybe it was a very low-speed coronal mass ejection showing up around L1, where the ACE and Discover spacecraft are located measuring the real-time solar wind. Let's just look at the current conditions and move on. Current wind speed for the solar wind is 444 kilometers per second. Current solar wind density incredibly low at only 2 protons per cubic centimeter. Global geomagnetism calm here, and each one of those bars represents 3 hours. The KP index currently at 2. And let's take a look at geospace magnetosphere movies. Here's four hours of data modeled by the Space Weather Modeling Framework. If you're wondering what's going on in the magnetosphere, well, not a lot. It's fairly homogeneous here over the past four hours. Most of the pressure oriented on the non-sun side of the Earth, the magnetotail side of the planet shown to your right here. And you're looking at 90 degree imagery here the equatorial and meridional planes. Nothing to write home about there. How about ground magnetic perturbations? Changes to Earth's B field. We showed you the suns. Here is geospace delta B. Changes to Earth's B field. We'll let it play through as it refreshed. We did see a magnetic pulse coming out of Southeast Asia there, east of the Bay of Bengal. So some 
Some little magnetic perturbations going on there. Also in the West Pacific, very minor. And sometimes conditions are right. It gives you a little bit of insight into what's going on, perhaps deep in the Earth's mantle or outer core or perhaps inner core. Here's what's going on in the solar system. If you're wondering where stuff's located, there's where it is. Let's show where it'll be in a week. There's where things will be in a week. Werewolves will be coming out around the three days associated with the full moon. Yes, werewolves, they come out the day before, the day of, and the day after the full moon. As they don't look at star charts or watch our videos, werewolves are dummies. They're going out and eating human flesh in the middle of the night. I'll pass. Here's a star chart I use in-the-sky.org. You can see Betelgeuse is actually up near the top of the ecliptic at the moment. That's Betelgeuse, by the way. Orion's belt makes a perpendicular line to Betelgeuse. If you ever want to look at it, it's a very conspicuous star. Alpha Orionis, otherwise known as Betelgeuse. Our cosmology segment is going to be integrated once again into the Daily Space Weather video. It's pretty short. Today's featured object is Galaxy NGC 5920, a likely elliptical radio galaxy. Here are the X-ray transient hard X-rays out, output from it. There's your 30-day chart. And up here we've got a like a half a year chart. I don't even know what that is. Anyway, if you click on Simbad from any of these Neil Gorel Swift Bat X-ray Observatory objects, this is what the Neil Gorels looks like. If you click on that Simbad link, you can get to this, the CDS portal. And this is actually Galaxy NGC 5920 in radio frequency. And you can see that there is a radio lobe here. Uh, perhaps this is a jet. In fact, it does, it does certainly look a bit like a jet, as if this one is oriented a bit toward you, the observer, and that one is oriented a bit away from you, the observer. So some definitive imagery likely there in radio. <clears throat> and let's go up the frequency of electromagnetic spectrum. Let's take a look at infrared. Did I go past the two mass already? Let's look at lazy. Ah, pretty good high resolution image imagery there. The thermal output from NGC 5920. And let's check some other wavelengths here. See if we can find the two mass, one of my favorites. And we've brought up all of the hips here. Let's find the two mass. And there's the two mass. University of Massachusetts infrared survey. Great imagery there of NGC 5920. It's a pretty hot place around that galactic core. And again, it looks like there may be a jet or two involved with this one, perhaps somewhat oriented toward us, the observer here in our solar, our solar system. And leave us a comment if you're viewing from a different solar system, plane of existence, timeline, etc. If you're an extra planar entity and you're viewing the videos, please leave us a comment. Let us know. Share with your extra planar friends and foes. Let's take a look at it on the two mass. Optical bands here. Very high resolution imagery of this elliptical radio galaxy. Spectacular imagery there from the optical band two mass survey. And we'll take a quick look at the galax. There's some UV imagery the ultraviolet spectrum. And last but not least, let's bring up the Chandra. Actually, first, how about the XMM Newton? Check that out. Great X-ray imagery there of NGC 5920. Perhaps giving us some insight into jet structure. And here's the Chandra X-ray survey. Pretty high resolution imagery there of that radio galaxy. Continuing on to look at the astronomy picture of the day, and it is spectacular. Yes, I know. It's not really Mars. It's a desert in Nevada or something. Sure it is. Anyway, here is the astronomy picture of the day, and it is quite a spectacular 3D panorama of the surface of the red planet. 
Check out those overcast skies. Look at looking a little bit alien to you right now. Yeah. Looking a little bit alien to me as well. I like all the gray features that look like lunar regolith mixed in with the reddish rock. Just a spectacular panorama of another planet's surface. Talk about some radio-controlled vehicles. These are some serious radio-controlled vehicles, folks. And you'll see the shadow of one down here. It's not the character from the short circuit movies. It's okay, maybe it is. Anyway, check it out if you like, apod.nasa.gov, the astronomy picture of the day. That's today's cosmology segment. We made it brief, and we integrated it to the Daily Space Weather video. Check our playlist for lots of more other sorts of content. Hundreds of cosmology segments in our playlist. Next, looking at charging hazards. We don't see any at the moment. We're seeing low levels of electron flux here, and we're expecting an electron storm in the future. Here's a three-day chart. Nothing to write home about there from the GO 16 and 17. And you can see this precipitous uptick forecasted here. That can cause some communications, errors, and failures, and CCD bakeouts, and so on. A forecast for an electron storm coming in the next couple of days, and I would tend to agree with this. Next to the diagram of the atmosphere, feel free to pause the video. We're showing the total electron content forecast. And we've been seeing some chaos in these electron bands. Now we're just seeing very low levels, which is when we see the most chaos. Just pretty much normal total electron content. It's showing you the whole air column's air electron content. And the reason this causes GPS errors is when GPSs must communicate through very dense blobs of electron regions, it causes massive refraction and inability to calculate positions. Here's another diagram of the atmosphere showing electromagnetic radiation penetration and so on. The red F over there is the F ionosphere layer because that's what we're showing next. And we see some low frequency anomalies here as well as some high frequency anomalies. So you're looking at vibrational frequency here in the ionosphere. And as we approach the equinox, we're only about a week away from it. We will be streaming live to YouTube for the Equinox, by the way. Anyway, this is the last day's worth of data. And again, we are seeing some anomalies here of the both low and high frequency type. Here's the latest image. That's 11 o'clock universal time. And it's looking a little anomalous at the moment. Here's the anomaly map showing you departure in, a, in megahertz from the 30-day median. And you can see some high-frequency anomalies in the southern Atlantic Ocean and around the Drake Passage, one of the weirdest parts in the world, where the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans must go through this narrow passageway to try to reach static equilibrium. What happens when there's a massive low pressure over here and a massive high pressure over here, folks? What happens is that water is forced to head toward the low pressure zone through the Drake Passage. Does that have anything to do with the ionosphere? A little bit. Were you aware that water emits radiation? Yeah. Everybody who operates satellites is aware of this. And we hope you, the viewer, is aware as well. Here's 11 o'clock universal time. Just minor anomalies at the moment, but quite a few showing up on the map for the past day. Bruh. Are you, like, totally spaced out, bruh? Because we're totally meteorology out on the channel, too, bruh. And if you didn't check out our meteorology playlist, go check it out. It's pretty sweet. Here come bonus features for our daily space weather video in the form of the El Tai de Spain ground-based solar observatory. As we see sunspots set, we see new su sunspots about to rise. We see a coronal mass ejection warning. Turn down to a watch. Turn down to a nothing. Although our solar flare warning remains in effect until these sunspots are well out of sight. Here's your latest intensity gram image. As you see, 2886 and 2888, I think they are setting. And they're still capable of producing major solar flares even after, after they're out of sight. We've also got some anomalous looking magnetometer data here showing a very highly magnetically organized region over here, which makes no sense. It looks like erroneous data to me. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. And we'll close things out with some more imagery of the closest star here. 
Here's 304 angstroms alone, ionized helium. Here is 1,600 and 1,700 angstroms. The close-up view of the setting sunspot groups that pulled us almost to the point of cycle 24's solar maximum level of sunspots. We made it to about 124 sunspots there for a moment. Now dropping back down to zero before active regions rise in the east. Here's another composite. This is 94 and 193 angstroms, both ionized iron, ultraviolet emission spectra. And we'll close out the video on 304 and 171 angstroms, one of my favorite composites. It's great at showing magnetic looping as well as filaments. Filaments showing up there as red, that's ionized helium. Magnetic loops showing up in 171 angstroms, that's ionized iron. And we are out. Thanks again for tuning into the video. Congratulations on realizing our channel exists. And may that solar wind be at your back.